Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode or video, depending on whether you're watching or listening to this. So in this one, I'd like to discuss a little bit about restrictive lung disease, basically because I've received this one line question from unknown. <laughs> it's funny, uh, this doctor, what can one do for restrictive lung disease? So obviously it's a fairly vague question, but I'm going to try to cover a little bit what, what this means, what restrictive lung disease means and just go over a couple of possibilities and what one can do. Now, restrictive lung disease as a concept just means that basically the lungs do not expand as much as they should. Let's, let's just call it, that's a very big simplification. So that just means that basically when, the let's say the predicted volume of air in your lungs that can fit in your lungs is 4.5 liters. And because of some condition, you're not able to draw in that 4.5 liters of air and you're only able to draw in, let's just say, 3 liters. So that is a reduction to, well, about 66% of what was predicted. So if you imagine 4.5 liters being 100% and that's what you're supposed to breathe in as a normal individual, if you're breathing in only two-thirds of that, you're around 66% of predicted. So there are these measures that can be obtained uh, regarding these volumes on tests such as spirometry or plethysmography or other forms of lung function testing that measure the volumes of air that go in and out of the lungs. And if these volumes are reduced, the lungs do not fit as much air. Now, why is that? So this is just a def broad definition of restrictive lung disease. There is some restriction blocking the full, uh, the filling of lungs with air completely. Now, there can be different, many, many causes for this. There can be causes that are related to the lungs themselves or causes that are related to the chest wall or sometimes neurological causes. Basically, the nerves that supply the chest don't work well and breathing cannot really open that much. So basically, you are not able to, the nerves don't control the muscles well, so they, you cannot really use them properly to actually expand the lungs fully. So that's one thing that we can cover. Now, if we're talking about the chest wall, imagine that you can have a lot of people with a lot of chest deformities from trauma, from degenerative bone and joint disease from old age from bad posture things like that and that can lead to basically the lungs not being able to expand because the ribs cannot really expand you cannot really open up your chest fully and that's also restrictive lung disease but that's not necessarily something that's very easily fixed and generally restrictive lung disease is not something that can very easily be fixed now, when we're going inside the lungs and we're looking at that, there can be restrictive lung disease related to the lungs themselves or to the membrane that surrounds the lungs, such as the pleura. So, for example, if the pleura is hardened, thickened, basically, maybe you've had a chronic infection such as TB. Well, not a chronic infection, but a, a long-term infection such as TB with pleural effusions with fluid around the lungs and when it healed basically that left the scar within the pleura the lungs won't be able to expand because that membrane around them is hardened it doesn't let the sponge-like tissue of the lung to expand fully so that can be another reason for restrictive lung disease so as you can see we're trying to go from the outside in when we're looking at the lungs themselves restrictive lung disease can be caused generally by all kinds of lung fibrosis. Now, lung fibrosis just means scarring of the lungs. And this is where we open another big Pandora's box because restrictive lung disease caused by pulmonary fibrosis can have so many causes. It can be caused by disease outside the lungs. So for example, certain immunological diseases, autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, for example, scleroderma, they can have lung involvement leading to pulmonary fibrosis or lung scarring. And that can cause restrictive lung disease. And the treatment in that case is to treat the inflammation associated with those autoimmune 
systemic generalized conditions with treatments for those conditions and that sometimes can stop the fibrosis it doesn't really reverse the fibrosis but it can stop it from getting worse sometimes the lung fibrosis can be caused by other inflammatory conditions such as sarcoidosis which is a condition that affects can affect all organs of the body but it's most commonly seen in the lymph nodes in the chest and the lungs so that can cause again lung scarring and it's also treated with anti-inflammatory agents while on the topic of sarcoidosis tuberculosis can sometimes be mistaken for a sarcoidosis and it's an infection it's not inflammation as sarcoidosis but it is an infection and it can actually when it heals if it's been quite advanced before it was treated or it wasn't treated quickly enough or it was resistant to be it took a long time to actually get rid of the tuberculosis itself it can heal with scars within the lungs but i just mentioned it next to the sarcoidosis because sometimes especially if doctors aren't thinking about one or the other they can be mistaken for each other so again tuberculosis is another potential cause of restrictive lung disease after the disease has healed so if we've treated tuberculosis it's gone but it's left a bit of a complication then we're moving towards things that we can inhale from the environment that can cause lung scarring so this is where we talk about chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis so this is a condition where we can inhale different things from the environment these can vary from person to person and inhaling them can actually cause an inflammatory reaction in the lungs which if left unchecked evolving over a long period of time can lead to fibrosis and here examples would include for example will include basically uh, if someone is exposed to birds and they are sensitized their body has an ex hypersensitivity reaction to birds to bird proteins that are released from the feathers etc it can cause inflammation so if you have bird keepers people who use feathered pillows feathered duvets and are sensitized to to bird proteins they can develop lung fibrosis in this way sometimes you have what is called farmer's lung which is also within the scope of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in farmer's lung you basically inhale some of these organic dusts that are released from the hay that contain certain microorganisms these don't cause an infection, but they can cause this hypersensitivity inflammation in the lungs. And with exposure over a number of years, it can lead to uh, lung fibrosis again. So this is, there are many examples within the realm of hypersensitivity pneumonitis of potential exposures that can cause lung disease. Then talking about things that we inhale from the environment, it could be something related to your occupation, not in the sense of causing inflammation in the lungs but basically in the sense of ca causing damage to the lung by deposition of dusts within the lung and here we can think about coal workers so people who work in coal mines and they inhale a lot of coal dust at some point they will that dust will deposit itself within the lungs and harden the lungs so causing restrictive lung disease sometimes you have people who cut stone and they develop silicosis by inhaling that silica dust that can also cause a little bit of inflammation as well and a lot of problems so all of these occupational hazards are not sometimes very well understood and I've, I've made another episode another video recently about that to try to always protect your lungs because in the long run some of the things that we're exposed to in our environment in our house or in other places they can actually trigger lung, long term lung disease, chronic lung disease that can be very hard to treat. Now, with hypersensitivity pneumonitis that I mentioned before, if we're talking uh, about exposure to birds, exposure to hay, to other things that are causing the inflammation, we can sometimes remove ourselves from that environment and that usually improves the situation. Sometimes we may need some anti inflammatory drugs to treat the inflammation and help that healing process, reduce that inflammation, prevent further scarring. If we are talking about inhaling dusts in occupations, various occupations, working on construction sites, mines, etc., 
we probably need to change our job or use very good respiratory protection. So such as an FFP2 mask that is really tightly sealed around the airways so that we're not breathing in that dust every day at work to try to work in good, well-ventilated spaces. And I know that can be a problem with certain employers, especially in some countries around the world where the regulations are not very tight and they may not be able to provide actually the respiratory protection that you need. So you need to try to be aware of that and try to protect yourself if there's no other way to uh, change your job. If it's affecting your health, you need to think about it long term. How will you be feeling in five years if you're already feeling poorly? And the final thing I'd like to mention here about um, lung fibrosis, there is also the case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is when we get lung scarring, but we can't find the cause. So I've been listing a lot of causes now before of what can cause restrictive lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, lung scarring. But sometimes there is a diagnosis for the group of patients in which we've done a lot of tests, we've looked for causes, we can't find the cause and there's still lung scarring. And it's a very terrible condition if you think about it because sometimes it can affect people who have no exposures. They've been well and suddenly their lungs become scarred and we don't know why. And I had this gentleman actually today that I saw uh, in clinic and he was 72 years old. And basically he was telling me that he's been well all his life. And after he retired, he started with the fibrosis, which is, which, you know, it's a terrible thing. And we have medications in that case that can slow down this fibrosis process but it doesn't really reverse it we're not at the stage where we can reverse fibrosis of the lungs with treatment people are working on that there's a lot of research in the field but we're not there yet so at this stage we're basically left with two potential avenues for treatment if there is an active inflammation in the lungs caused by various things it could be other conditions within the body exposures from the environment anyway if we have inflammation we can treat it usually with anti-inflammatory drugs such as corticosteroids and that can reduce the inflammation if there is no evidence of inflammation it's that other side where we look more towards these anti-fibrotic anti-scarring medications which slow down the progress of the fibrosis and just to conclude this sometimes restrictive lung disease can be caused by uh, familial predispositions. So sometimes there are cases of lung fibrosis within families. So for example, if the father had fibrosis, then a son has fibrosis, uh, a cousin may also have the same disease or something related. So you can have sometimes this predisposition to getting these sort of scarring uh, diseases in the lungs within families. So it's really important in that situation, if especially if there have been a few family members with pulmonary fibrosis, to try to really avoid things that may damage the lungs because it may actually increase the odds of getting uh, restrictive lung disease, uh, lung fibrosis. So what can we do? As I was sort of going through this long, long list of potential causes, I hope that you understood that basically for restrictive lung disease, we need to try and treat the cause as much as possible if there is one that can be found. There may be, of course, other causes that I haven't mentioned in this video. But this was just to show you that there are so many causes that can be mechanical in nature, neurological in nature, related to what we inhale, uh, to, related to other conditions in the other organ systems that may touch the lungs as well, related to infections. So if there is an infection, such as tuberculosis, it's important to treat it early and effectively. If there is, for example, a pleural effusion, water along, uh, along, along, uh, around the, the lungs, we need to probably talk to our doctors, drain that, receive some treatment to prevent you know, healing with a complication, with a scar. Um, if there is a type of fibrosis in the lungs that we don't have a cause for, we may want to treat it with anti-fibrotic, anti-scarring medications to prevent worsening of that scarring. So there are many, many avenues of treatment but like I said, I was starting off this video with basically just one line of a question, what can we do for restrictive lung disease? It's really important to determine what the cause is. And just to say one more thing before I finish, 
we need to make sure that it's truly restrictive lung disease because sometimes many people I'm worried that they do a spirometry somewhere they perform one of these lung function tests they don't do it properly maybe the device is not well calibrated it looks like the lung function is restrictive but basically it wasn't a full effort and of course if you only blow half the air out of the lungs or you don't inhale to a full breath and then blow out all that air, it may look as if your lung volumes are artificially low. So always keep in mind that the breathing test needs to be performed in the standardized way, manner, as much as possible in order to make sure that what you're looking at, the numbers you're looking at, are indeed consistent with restrictive lung disease. So hopefully this was helpful. I know it was a bit long and you know covering a lot of issues, but I just wanted to tell you that it's really, really complex. It's a fascinating field, and if you have further questions, I'll try to break it down into smaller sections as I create more videos on this channel. I like this topic of lung fibrosis especially because it's my area of interest, so if you have further questions in that regard, I'll be happy to answer in future videos. If you are suffering with any medical problem, any condition, do talk to your doctor. Go see them early because that's the best way to seek appropriate help and to get the help you need as early as possible to prevent worsening. Thank you very much for watching and all the best.